You're watching FJTN, the Federal Judicial Television Network. Offenders uh, generally come into our system with limited job skills, limited employment skills, limited uh, job readiness skills, uh, limited educational skills. And this poses to, to be a challenge for the officers. One problem that pretrial services officers experience with defendants who perhaps have less uh, education than others is that they may not understand the court process. This is a difficult population to supervise because they lack a lot of skills, basic skills of life, uh, coping skills, they lack job skills. In fact, it goes beyond even the job skills. It goes to the uh, inability to even apply for a job. That lack of employment and that lack of educational skills certainly has affected supervision overall. Um, it's created um, more work for officers. Um, it's created a need for officers to find more resources, work with offenders more closely, to develop skills to assist them in daily life. The problem that arises is that frequently this, the information the court could rely upon to begin to shape some kind of a disposition that takes these deficits into consideration, that information is not before the court in a timely fashion. So the court doesn't really find out about the problem until the situation is down the road. For example, the defendant is sentenced and the court decides to send an individual to get uh, his GED. Individuals involved in employment programs, job readiness programs, or educational programs tend to refrain from violating uh, the law. When the matter comes back, you find out that the individual has not followed through with the GED program. And the question arises, why? They're not necessarily in a, in a place in their lives that they're motivated to to make changes and to um, try to better themselves. They, they're not necessarily going to ask us for assistance. Uh, with a little more investigation, and I'm speaking about a case that I have clearly in mind as my own, you find out that the real problem is, thanks to the insights of the probation officer, you learn that the real problem is that the person can't read. It's actually the function of the probation office to address those needs. Um, I think it's been difficult and I think it continues to be challenging, but based on the definition of the role, it's a multi-dimensional role and it's our obligation to fulfill that. My experience has been that the offenders are thankful that they're getting some attention, but you will run across individuals who are very difficult to work with. And that's just a little more draining on the officer's part, but we do our best. Live on FJTN from the nation's capital, the Federal Judicial Center presents Special Needs Offenders, Reducing risk through employment and education. Now here's your program host, Mark Maggio. Well, hello everyone and welcome to our continuing Special Needs Offenders series. Today's topic, as the title suggests, is reducing risk through employment and education. As we saw in the opening clip, offenders and defendants with limited job skills, limited education, those who simply have trouble managing basic life tasks, pose a challenge to almost everyone in the federal system. Through discussions with panelists both here in the studio and at several Push to Talk sites, we'll explore those challenges and learn what officers are doing to successfully manage them. By sharing strategies for investigation and supervision, we may better understand this population and perhaps help ease the management of officers' already busy caseloads. As you know, each program in the Special Needs Offenders series consists of bulletins, broadcasts, and online conferences that take an in-depth look at one unique defendant offender population. You should have already received the first part of this Reducing Risk program, the Special Needs Offender Bulletin, that introduces our target population in detail. And you should also have the Participant Guide, available on the JNET, that's especially devoted to the next step in this series, which is today's broadcast. This broadcast is for you, and we encourage you to participate, ask questions, and share your thoughts with us. We've built in time for discussion throughout the program. Our toll-free phone and fax numbers will appear on the screen throughout the broadcast. Feel free to use the fax form that was also on the JNET at any time during the broadcast. 
Now, we'll go on to today's agenda. Our first panel will introduce today's topic with an overview, identifying problems, abilities, and community resources. Then I'll come back to explain what works in investigation and supervision. Next, we'll move to our second panel and discuss overcoming resistance, after which we'll take a short break and come back to our third panel on developing community partners and in-house programs. Then, with our last panel, we'll discuss mitigating life skills related conflict with a final wrap-up at the end. Now, you'll see me throughout the program primarily as the voice of the fax machine. And since we have a lot to cover in the next two hours, let's get right to it and turn the program over to our moderator, Mark Sherman, who will introduce our first panel. Thanks, Mark. Our first topic is an overview that highlights the importance of identifying problems, abilities, and community resources. And in the studio today, we have Verdell Freeman, Senior U.S. Probation Officer for the District of Columbia, and Elizabeth Barola, Supervising U.S. Pretrial Services Officer from the District of Arizona. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. For this panel and throughout the program, we'll set the stage, stage so to speak, with a short video clip. To kick off this discussion, we'll take a closer look at Thomas Derek Ross. You'll remember he was featured in the Special Needs Offenders Bulletin. It's from the PBS documentary series, Seeking Solutions with Hedrick Smith. Let's take a look. This is Benning Terrace, a public housing project and ground zero of a bloody gang feud between two rival camps, the Alabama Avenue crew and the Circle crew. Derek Ross was a leader of the Circle. You can just walk right up here down the street with an assault rifle or something, and you didn't have the worst you had to worry about was some senior citizen get on the telephone and calling the police and saying something about it. So it became a city of lawlessness. So where there's anarchy, there you had it. The street war claimed the lives of eight young men in just eight months. Then in January 1997, Daryl Hall of Benning Terrace was abducted at gunpoint on his way home from school and brutally shot in the back of the head. He was only 12. The D.C. Housing Authority manages Benning Terrace. To stop the killing, Housing Chief David Gilmore decided to tear down part of the circle. I actually ordered the staff to prepare the demolition application at that moment. I said, it's time for us to do this. It's time for us to wipe it out. As Daryl's murder hit the headlines, Street soldiers Tyrone Parker and Rico Rush were deeply disturbed. We wanted to, to stop the killing. That's what we wanted to do. But we had no idea how we were going to do it. So I said, the only thing we can do is go up there and talk to the kids, talk to those who are basically involved creating these problems. Rico and Tyrone began contacting Avenue and Circle gang members. Ain't nothing can stop it. It'll stop when it stops. I mean, y'all can't stop it. The police tried to stop it. The men ran into a stone wall. Talking to the kids, Rico saw himself. All, all those guys that was talking big, and they're going to do this, and they're going to do that, and we're going to shoot you, we're going to shoot you, you know, we're going to do that. All, deep down inside, they just want somebody to care about them. And that's how I was. Some might call Rico Rush and Tyrone Parker unlikely street saviors. In their youth, both went to jail. Tyrone for bank robbery, Rico for weapon and drug charges. But they turned their lives around and committed themselves to a group they call the Alliance of Concerned Men. Their past helps them understand street fighters like those at Benning Terrace. To help young men and women along and build their confidence, the Alliance teaches life skills. Once involved in a young person's life, they become totally committed, 24 hours a day. They operate on a simple principle, that deep down, everyone wants nurturing. Even the toughest of the tough want the human touch. They're always ready to listen and step in whenever things go wrong. They pray together. In these words, we say, Amen! They break bread together. And taking a lesson from Rico, they hug. 
But when they showed up at Benning Terrace right after Daryl Hall's murder, the alliance was viewed with suspicion. I left because I was like, this they police. They could be wired. I'm not even talking to them. So I left. Derrick Ross had a spirit that was non-negotiable, no tolerance, very cold. Ran it with an iron fist. Whatever Derrick said, that's how it was going to be. But the alliance persisted and earned the guy's respect. After years of street war, the circles and avenues agreed to drop their weapons and stop their feud. When their truce makes headlines, Housing Chief David Gilmore reads about it in the Washington Post. I'm sitting there uh, uh, reading this paper and saying to myself, that's it, somebody has had the better idea. Dropping his plan to start demolition at Benning Terrace, well, Gilmore agrees to pay the street guys to remove the graffiti. Well, Gilmore was essential because it's one thing for us to give a man a spiritual uplift. He still got to eat. The avenues and circles work side by side to remove years of painful memories. Gradually, Benning Terrace goes from ghost town back to neighborhood once again. Success at Benning Terrace prompts Gilmore to assign these former gang members to jobs across the city, improving other DC housing properties. The biggest surprise. Good morning, DCHA James Creek. Former circle leader Derek Ross. This is the same guy Hello. that a lot of people said that it, I don't know why you're going to talk to him. He'll never talk to y'all. He'll never do this. He'll never do that. This kid has literally taken his life and flipped it upside down. Or shall we say, righted it from where it was. And that was done to us only five. It was called Among in. hundreds of applicants, Derek wins one of 12 coveted slots in the Housing Authority's Management Internship Program. He works in a property management office. Question number nine. And he goes to college. And that's all. To get certified to be a property manager anywhere in the country. I didn't think it could happen because it had never happened actually to me until the alliance and stuff came along. And marching from the avenue to the circle. Victory, victory, victory is now. Determination. They celebrate how far they have come together. If it can happen in Benning Terrace, in one of the most violent neighborhoods in one of the most violent cities in America, if it can happen there, then it can occur in every community. All right, Elizabeth, let's start with you. The goal of this segment of the program is to highlight the importance of identifying problems, abilities, and community resources. So to get us started, um, in your view, what were some of Ross's abilities that helped contribute to his success, but also what are some of his problems that contribute to his continuing difficulties? Well, Mark, I see very clearly that Ross has abilities in his leadership qualities and in his basic survival instincts. Mm -hmm. And even though these abilities and skills were gathered in a non-traditional, really <laughs> negative way through his gang affiliation, nonetheless, there's still transferable skills that an officer can use to build on a successful supervision plan. Mm -hmm. And I also think that Ross has a very, very clear picture of the problems he faces in his environment and in his neighborhood. Clearly he knows that there are obstacles, there are barriers that he needs to overcome. He's very aware of that. But he also has some negative attributes as well. He mm -hmm. continues to have what appears to be a, an anger management problem. Mm -hmm. He has some prior substance abuse history and even maybe some possible current alcohol use. Right. So those things continue to plague him and things that he'll have to address and if he's going to succeed. Verdell? Yes. I concur with what was said by Elizabeth. Uh, Mr. Ross utilized the community agencies to assist him as being a leader in the group, which Elizabeth indicated was is a negative. He was able to turn a negative around to be something positive. Mm -hmm. The housing authorities uh, saw something that needed to be done, mm -hmm. and they used it to their best interest. Mm -hmm. they, they hired him. They taught him a skill. They encouraged him to go to school to become a, a resident manager. Mm -hmm. There were people out in the community that believed in him, and they, and they worked with him. I mean, this is our own backyard here in D.C., and your own backyard as an, as an officer. It's interesting to see how 
they were able to identify his leadership abilities and take them from you know being a gang member to working at the at the housing authority and perhaps becoming a property manager later on. That's correct. Um, the housing authorities they were talking about you know tearing down a, a building, people's homes, development that has been in D.C. since probably the 1950s. Mm -hmm. They saw something that they could do that was a change, and they captured on that change. And the community, government, as well as nonprofit agency came forth to assist. Right, right. Um, it might be a good time now just to go out to our Push to Talk at sites. Uh, Arizona Pretrial in Phoenix, are you with us? Hi, Mark. This is Regina Begay. Hi, Regina. How are you? Good. 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 Any comments or reactions to anything that we've said here so far or questions that you might have uh, following up from this initial, initial intervention? We agree with the panelists that Mr. Ross possessed, possessed strong leadership skills. In addition, a problem that we saw is that as he's going through this transition from criminal to being a productive member of society, he's having difficulty coping with the common daily obstacles. For example, his multiple family obligations, which lead to stress and to anger and to substance abuse and right. so on. Great point. Elizabeth, any reaction to that? I think that's probably true. Those are things that aren't going to go away. They're, going to, they're things that he has to work through and continue to try to address. And he's going to have uh, relapses, so to right. speak. He's going to slide backwards a bit. But he's, he, I think he's going to keep trying to keep going forward. Right. Rudell? Yes, and he also has a mechanisms in the community that assist him right. with that. Although he um, <clears throat> obtained a new arrest, the housing authorities, the concerned citizens, um, they allowed his concerned citizens, they didn't turn their back on him. They continued to stand there with him as a family, and they pushed him on. Right. Regina, it's particularly an interesting point because yesterday, as we were rehearsing this thing, uh, we were talking about how dealing with, with defendants and offenders like this is sort of a two steps forward, one step b back process. Uh, would you agree? I agree. Um, and, and so your, your question really sort of brings that home. Um, my understanding is that we've, we've got a fax coming in as well, so maybe we can go to Mark Maggio for that. Mark? Okay, Mark, we've got the uh, first question. looks like some questions for folks uh, that are watching the program here in the building to sort of help get the program started right. for us. And your first question on Ross. Ross seems to be the exception. How do you get someone to participate in such a program when they're not motivated? Verdell, Elizabeth? I think it's important to realize that he might be the exception to, to the norm, or he might be a success story, as we might call it. But at the same time, I think it's important for us to strive for those kind of results for each one of our clients. And that means breaking through resistance, and it means establishing trust, engendering uh, a relationship there, and helping them really as a helping agent uh, to break through some of those barriers. So it's really up to us to, to attempt to help him break through some of that resistance. Mm -hmm. I agree with what was said by, um, also by Elizabeth. I do not see Mr. Uh, Ross as being an exception to the rule, mm -hmm. as I pointed out yesterday. You did. You probably see, see this as a very depressing profession and since you're the community resources specialist in your district. That's correct. I think that we can see some good in all of them, mm -hmm. as the Alliance of Concerned Men pointed out, that these young men in the community, as well as young women, were looking for some nurturing, someone to care about them, to care about the environment, mm -hmm. and to come in to make a change. And that's some of the things that the probation officer argued to do. It's interesting that you've mentioned that uh, there are young women involved, too. And I'm wondering whether you've noticed an increase in the number of young women who are, in, who are similarly situated. Yes, we are seeing an increase of uh, female offenders on supervision now. How about you, Elizabeth? Are you Same thing. Yeah. We see a tremendous uh, influx now of women, um, not, maybe not as many as the men, sure. but certainly more than we have sure. in the past. Sure. I've seen several stories in the press lately about that. And, mm -hmm. uh, was just wondering if uh, if that was in fact the case. And apparently so. Yes, it is. All right. Regina, I wanted to get back to you, uh, but before we do that, I wanted to ask you if you could please turn the volume down on your uh, monitor in, 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 in at your site. We're getting some feedback here. I'll give you a minute to do that, and then ask you guys what, out in Phoenix whether you had anything further to add or any further questions based on uh, what we've said here so far.
Mark, we don't have any other thing to add. Great. Okay. Moving right along then. Um, Verdell, next question. Um, uh, it would be good for you to talk about the community resources that we saw in the clip that, um, that have been able to sort of help Ross. Uh, and then, after we've talked about that a little bit, maybe talk about some of your own experiences working with community resources here in the district. The D.C. Housing Authority, which is a government agency, right. has been, about, been a, about for many years. And they have been able to assist many of our clients um, with low-income Section 8 housing. So this is, this is an agency that you've already had some experience yes, with. It, yes, it is. As well, as well as the Alliance of Concerns Men. Mm -hmm. um, not only do they work with men, they also work with women. Mm -hmm. They provide them with counseling, with housing referrals, um, anger management, mm -hmm. uh, family counseling. Mm -hmm. Life skills, like life they skills, say in the clip. Basically life skills. Mm -hmm. Being able to teach them to get from A to Z right. and back. Right. In the years that I've been working at the probation office, I have utilized many resources and Community Family Life Services has been very instrumental to the probation office in the District of Columbia. Community Resources is a nonprofit agency, and they have assisted one of my female clients who has extensive prior arrest record, um, who has eight children, mm -hmm. who had a, a limited education. She dropped out of school in the eighth grade, and they have a GED program, mm -hmm. so they assisted her in obtaining her GED. And Community Family Life Services is, is, is a non-governmental, relatively small nonprofit organization here in D.C. That is correct, but they do wonderful things in the community. Mm -hmm. They have a housing project. How did you find out about them? Do you remember? They've been around a while. I learned about Community Family Life Services in 1976 when mm -hmm. I was a volunteer mm -hmm. for the U.S. Probation Office and developing resources in the community. You go out, you knock on doors, you find out what um, services they offer, and then you funnel your clients into that agency. And since Community Family Life Services was already working with D.C. Superior Court, right. we wanted to find out, well, why can't you work with U.S. District Court? And they've been a excellent resource since 1975-76. Interesting. Okay, my understanding, I want to get to Elizabeth, but before we do, I understand that we have a phone call from Pamela. Uh, is it the Southern District of New York? <coughs> Hi, yes it is. Hi, how are you? I'm fine, how are you? Fine, welcome. Thank you. Um, my question is, I'm, also, I'm working as a community service resource, mm -hmm. and I'm also, I need to lower this, huh? Great, yeah. Okay, I'm also working with the employment end of um, our, in our district, mm -hmm. and the problems that I found along the way is just dealing with employers who can't seem to get by the stigma attached to the conviction and even though um as Ms. freeman was saying and i'm sorry i don't remember the other um participants name, Elizabeth. but as she was saying you, you're trying and you're working with them but the rejection that they're receiving over and over from employers who are just they just refuse sure. to work with them how do you, how have you been overcoming um the education process of the employer as opposed to the employees it's an excellent question, and, and we'll address it here, but I also would ask you to stay tuned because we're also going to be talking about this later in the broadcast when we talk about developing community partners. Um, and there are some folks who, who will be here to help you sort of figure out some guidelines and think about how to go about that. But I know, Verdell, you've had a lot of experience with this. We, in fact, we've talked about this very same thing. Yes. Uh, give some advice to Pamela. Well, in the District of Columbia, there are a great deal of incentives in hiring next offenders. There is the um, job tax credit. Mm -hmm. There is a bonding program. Mm -hmm. The job tax credit is any nonprofit, well, government or nonprofit agency that will hire an offender, and the offender remains on the job for at least six months, will receive a $1,500 tax credit. Mm -hmm. Also, there's a federal bonding program in the District of Columbia, and there are incentives for hiring ex offenders. But you really have to educate the employer. Right. You have to let him know that you need to judge the offender on his workabilities mm -hmm. and not on his past, mm -hmm. that we do screen our offenders very carefully. We will assure them that there are no history of mental illness, no assaultive behavior, that they're drug-free and alcohol-free. 
and we do give them an officer's name that if there are any questions that they have direct contact with. Mm -hmm. So interestingly, what you have to do is sort of provide a mix of incentives for the officer, for the employer to That's go along with you. Uh, and I think that, the, that certainly the tax incentives are something that they need to know up, up front. That's correct. But you also, you refer your best client. Okay. When you There's send them out on the job, you send your best client. And you, and you let the employer know that, you know, this person, I think, will fit the bill. But you let the employer call you back later because he's going to look. If you send him your best, he will call you back and he wants another person. Sure. So you've Just broken like the ice. You've basically. broken the ice. But you also have to let the employer know that everyone is not going to be like Mr. Jones. Right. Okay. There will be people that will may not stay on the job as long, may not work to Mr. Jones' um, ability. But at least you've broken the ice and you maintain contact with that employer mm -hmm. and you, you, know, you develop a trust and a rapport with them. Excellent. Uh, my understanding is that the caller is now, panel is now off the line, but Pamela, I hope that helps. And Rudell, I don't want to put you on the spot, but would it be all right for Pamela to, to give you a call on the DC probation? Sure, she may. All right, so there you go. Um, I, my understanding is that we also have a fax in from the DC probation office, so let's go to, uh, let's go to Mark for that. Mark? Okay, um, yes, from the D.C. Probation Office, Verdell, your folks are watching you, so. Thank you. <laughs> Not to put any pressure on you there. In Mr. Ross's current position as a resident manager, do you consider this placement as a third-party risk? I would not think that the placement as a resident manager would be a third-party risk simply because Mr. Gilmore, who is in charge of um, the housing, it's a charge of housing authority, was aware of Mr. Ross' criminal background. Also, um, Mr. Ross was a resident of the Benning Heights dwelling, and in order to be in Section 8 housing, there are background checks mm -hmm. that are conducted on all of the tenants, mm -hmm. and he would be considered as a risk at this time, but Mr. Ross also has a history of drug abuse, right. as well as a history of anger management. But with the probation officer monitoring his adjustment on supervision and maintaining contact with his supervisor, at any time that Mr. Ross falls out of graces with his conditions, then he may become a risk. And it's the responsibility of the probation officer at that time to adjust a plan or notify his supervisor of maybe moving him from the job of responsibility because as a resident manager, he does have a lot of responsibility. All right. Uh, Elizabeth, I want to get you into the discussion here a little bit uh, and backtrack a bit. And I'm wondering whether you had any response to Pamela, Pamela's previous call where she was talking about difficulty with employers or whether you've come across that at all. Well, I think that we have to look at Mr. Ross's situation also where, for example, the Alliance was a tremendous resource and support system for him. And I do think it's, it is possible that you're going to run across problems with your employers. Right. Uh, particularly in a pretrial setting where so much of the information is confidential and we can't release things and we can't really talk to people about uh, certain things. So I think that from a pretrial perspective you need to be very careful about what you do with employers, but I do think you should still be out there trying to look for resources, making those community connections, and keep trying with employers. You may have to try several of them before you find some that will actually stick, good. but I think that that's something we need to keep doing. Good, good. Um, we're, we're, we're closing in on the end of this segment, so I'm thinking what we would do is perhaps uh, take a look at the next question here and then go directly out to our, to our um, Push to Talk site in Mississippi Northern. The question is this. Um, we know that since the filming of the PBS documentary that Ross has been arrested on a child abuse charge. He pled guilty and he was sentenced to weekend jail and probation. Uh, Mississippi Northern, are you with us? Yeah, Mark, we're here. I'm sorry to put you on the spot. Who, who, who's speaking? Mark, this is Danny McKittrick. Danny, how are you? We only have a couple of minutes left. Um, I, I wanted to ask, just go directly to you all and, and, and see how, how would you handle this situation now that he's been rearrested, pled guilty, and sentenced? How would you handle this if, if you were his probation officer? Mark, we looked at this case as a district, and uh, we came up with several things that we thought would be imperative in the supervision of this case, and, and particularly the continued supervision. Okay. First thing that we uh, would do was to get in touch with the uh, new probation officer that apparently has been assigned to this case as a result of this uh, child abuse charge. Um, we, we felt
felt like that we would also want to contact the counselor that was going to be uh, handling the anger management and the parenting skills that he would be involved in, and, and to particularly uh, really to verify that he was actively participating in that program. Uh, we also considered the third-party risk in this case, but from a different angle than, than was brought up earlier, in that we were concerned about the third-party risk of him being in the home with this child. Um, we weren't for sure whether he was actually living in the residence where the child was assaulted, uh, but, but that was certainly something that we would uh, take into consideration. Okay. And, and if it was determined that he was actually spending time in this residence with this child, uh, we considered placement in a community corrections center, okay. mm -hmm. CCC placement, uh, particularly until he completed the anger management uh, uh, and the parenting program. Let me, let me stop. Um, the, the other thing that... Excuse me. Let me stop you there. Let me stop you there, okay. Danny, um, because we've only got about 45 seconds left in this segment, and I wanted to quickly get to Elizabeth because she's got a probation background as well as a pretrial background. So, Elizabeth, your reactions to what Danny's talking about? I think that's very important. They're taking a very close look at not only his the positives in his life, but his limitations as well, and, and that includes the anger management. Mm -hmm. That's a terrific way of looking at it from that perspective of the third-party risk. Also dealing with the children. Exactly, and if if need be, to place him in a community correction center for a while, that would be the ultimate if we'd be able to still keep him in the community and we'd still be able to work with him but we'd be able to watch him as well. Right so it's really a holistic approach exactly. to the entire thing. Right. Well excellent Danny I, I hope that helps. Uh, we, we've we've got to leave it there unfortunately because we are out of time. I really really appreciate uh, the, the contributions of all of the sites and the phone calls. Um, great discussion. Uh, that's basically how our panels are going to work for the rest of the program. We'll start with the studio, we'll move to the push to talk sites, We'll get some faxes and phone calls in and continue uh, with discussions and comments. Um, we'll learn more, learning from each other. But now that we've finished the overview, let's pause for a brief look at the learning principles for this segment and then go back to Mark Maggio, who'll talk about a model framework. The January 2000 Special Needs Offenders Bulletin introduced officers to a model for investigating and supervising disadvantaged defendants and offenders. The model integrates the related tasks of supervision, case management, including investigation, and program evaluation. Further, because it emphasizes reducing risk, enforcing conditions, and applying correctional treatment, it fits well with the enhanced supervision approach. The remainder of the broadcast will focus on tools and guidelines that fit this model. Keep this model in mind throughout the broadcast, especially as Mark Sherman takes us into our next topic. Now that we looked at that model, Let's get into some specific techniques for assessing defendants and offenders. Elizabeth remains here with us, and joining us now is Brian DeMar, a senior U.S. probation officer from the Southern District of Texas. Welcome, Brian. Good afternoon. Let's first take a look at a short vignette which takes place at a pretrial intake interview. Nathan Hale is beginning pretrial supervision today with the United States Pretrial Services Officer, Joanne Smith. In preparation for this interview, Smith has reviewed Hale's file, which indicates that he was charged with possession with intent to distribute a small quantity of marijuana. He has one prior misdemeanor drug offense. Hale completed high school through the 10th grade and possesses no special skills or training. He was raised by his mother in a suburban working class neighborhood and has lived continuously with her and his younger sister. Hale is not married and has no dependents. He is unemployed and has no source of income. He previously held a series of minimum wage food service jobs, such as dishwasher and busboy. Thank you. 
Okay, now that we've gone through the conditions of release, Mr. Hale, do you have any questions? No, no questions. Is that it? Uh, just a few more items. Uh, I see that you're living with your mother and younger sister on uh, Sutton? Yep. How about uh, any job prospects? Anything lined up? Uh, you know, I notice here that you could get your GED. That could lead to better job opportunities. Guess I've never thought about it. Well, you really should think about it, Mr. Hale. And about your housing situation. I'm familiar with your neighborhood, and frankly, I'm a little concerned about you living in that environment. Now look, there's nothing wrong with where I live. I didn't say that there was. However, you might want to think of some alternative living arrangements, because the judge may not want you to live there much longer. No. Well, you need to give this some serious thought. I'm, I'm sure you'll think of something. Look, my mom and my sister are there, and all my friends, too. I like where I live. I don't need to move. Well, we'll come back to that later. Now, what about employment? Finding and maintaining a job is a special condition of your release. Now, you understand what that means, right? That means that if you do not find and maintain a job, the judge will revoke your pretrial release. So, do you know of any places where you might apply for work? I used to work in a few restaurants. I suppose I could see if there's any place around my house that needs help. That's a good idea. Do you enjoy working in restaurants? Well then, Mr. Hale, I think we're uh, just about done. Um, I need you to return in a week with a list of at least three applications you've submitted and interviews you've had with a contact person for each. You can use this verification report. Uh, let's see. How about the ninth? Sure. Elizabeth, this is a pretrial situation, so it makes sense to start with you. Um, this is a difficult situation, but Let's talk about what the defendant's positive and negative attributes are that the pretrial services officer might consider in putting together the supervision plan. Well, I think it's important for the pretrial officer to consider that there are some positives in this case. Uh, he does have a support system through his mother and sister that he seems to enjoy and be it's important to him. And then he also has some education and some job history. It's not substantial, but it's something to work from. Right. And the officer can build, again, a supervision plan from this. He does have some negatives in his um, background, sure. Uh, but in terms of his environment, that's one of the big things. And that, as the officer alluded to in the clip, is something he's going to have to deal with. Because, in fact, the court may order him to deal with that situation. Right. And he's very resistant. He's very resistant. He's upset. And um, the officer is going to have to consider all of those things when she's preparing the uh, supervision plan. Mm -hmm. What about uh, any help from a support system? I know you and I have talked in the past about the importance of support systems, particularly with, with defendants like this one. What, anything there to work with? Absolutely. If, if he has a good relationship with his mother and his sister, he's going to be, she's going to be able to work and make some connections and collateral contacts with them. It's important, I think, for the officer to be involved in his life in that way so that they can help her bring him back in and maybe into compliance if necessary. Right. Brian, let's get you in on this. I know you deal with this type of, of, of client, offender, all the time. Yes. Um, anything there to build on for you? Um, I agree with Elizabeth. Um, there appears to be good family support. Um, I would want to make contact with the mother and the sister to introduce myself with them, mm -hmm. to establish a rapport with mm -hmm. them, mm -hmm. and to communicate to them that I, too, am interested in Nathan, and we want to have a positive supervision experience. Mm -hmm. So you want to do some more digging, basically. Exactly. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, I know that uh, we, we've talked about the importance of having a support system there. Um, other than sort of making contact with, with the mother, how, how long would you wait? before making contact with his support system? 
with Nathan, I wouldn't wait too long. <laughs> um, considering his um, attitude, his negative disposition during our initial interview, right. I would try to make contact with Nathan before the end of the week. Right. Make a home visit, um, communicate to Nathan that I intend to come by the house to meet with him, mm -hmm. his mother, and his sister, mm -hmm. and, and inform Nathan. I might even make a telephone call to mom and sister to introduce myself, to break the ice, and to go by there and have a family conference. Mm -hmm. So you want to bring everything everybody into oh, the yes. discussion here. With Nathan, yes. All right. Uh, well, since this is a pretrial situation, it may make sense for us to first go out to North Carolina Eastern pretrial to get your responses to our discussion or any, any questions you might have. Uh, and then we've got a fax. North Carolina pre Eastern pretrial, are you with us? I hear something in the studio, but... Yes, Mark, we're here. How are you? Welcome aboard. We're fine. How are you? Good, thanks. Good, thanks. Uh, what, any reactions or questions? Well, Mark, uh, hold on. Let's see if we can fix this problem. Sure. Okay, take two. Here we go. Um, are we coming in now? Yep. Okay. We, we do agree with, with DeMar that the contact with the mother is probably the most crucial thing that needs to happen first because um, through the vignette we weren't able to tell exactly what the mother's history is, what kind of a person she is, what her expectations of her son are. So we would first really seriously need to look into that to see what his home situation really is because at this point we just don't know. Mm -hmm. Reaction, Brian? Oh, I agree. Yeah. Um, I think we see Nathan. Nathan's given us one side, yeah, one, one point of view. Um, I would be very curious as to mother's point of view, her feelings about Nathan, as well as the sister, and evaluate that relationship. Is it a good, is it a positive support system, or is it a negative support system? Mm -hmm. Elizabeth, reactions? Again, I think it takes a really uh, positive skew if the relationship is good. That's a tremendous foundation to build from. And that's something you want to find out up front. Absolutely. Interesting. North Carolina pretrial, anything, uh, anything more to add to this conversation? Sure, we have lots more to add. Yeah, let's <laughs> well, take it to us. OK, um, some of the things that we found, um, uh, we're dealing with education, employment, and life skills. We weren't really sure if they were positive or negative without further exploration. Sure. So some other things we would like to look into would be, especially um, relating to life skills, is what role has his father played in his life? Where is his life? Has he had a positive male influence in his life that would give him someone to emulate as far as getting out in the world? Because I know the officer had mentioned that she wanted him to possibly get out from the residence with the mother and get out of that neighborhood that she deemed to be bad. Well, does he have any kind of life experience to get out and live on his own? We don't know that. We don't know if he has any experience whatsoever of being a responsible citizen, responsible for paying his own bills and for doing that. We, know, we already know that his work experience is very limited. So what experience does he have managing his own money and his own circumstances? Sure. So you're going to just want to look at the whole thing. You're going to want to do some serious digging here before you, you, before you make any decisions. Correct. Okay. Uh, and, and the question, the, the point is, is, is an excellent one and really provides a, a good segue into the next question. But, bef but before we get to that, we do have a fax. I want to turn to Mark Maggio for that. Mark? Mark, you've got two questions here. They're basically getting at the same general point, so I'm going to give them to you very quickly. And they might even be questions that you'll find you can carry through uh, discussion with some of the other panel members. First one comes from Jennifer Marsh. And Jennifer asks, can you suggest a few good assessment tools that officers can use to identify an offender's strengths and areas for improvement in terms of education, employment, and life skills? I'm especially interested in ones that can be used with the offender to develop goals and a plan that is reasonable and realistic. The second question from Kathleen Oker at, in Ohio Northern basically is, is asking, is there any use of a career or interest type testing to determine what type of education and or employment might be best suited for the offender? Kind of both getting to the same point, so I thought you might be able to run with those. 
Good. All right. Uh, I want to ask Brian first, since uh, we're going to talk later on in the broadcast about your reasoning and rehabilitation program, your in-house program, that kind of thing, in terms of career testing. Have you had any experience with that at all? Um, no, I haven't. But we have, um, thanks to the Northern District of uh, California, we do have a an assessment tool that we use for co cognitive skills deficits. Okay. If the offender meets three of those eight criteria, we know that there's a need. There's a need to be concerned. We have a high risk offender mm -hmm. and we need to make the appropriate referrals. Mm -hmm. And that that tool can be used um, not only for referring to the R and R program, but to determine the needs of an offender mm -hmm. and so that you can make the, the appropriate referrals. Okay. Uh, Elizabeth, any experience with you know referring folks for career testing or uh, any other type of sort of outside testing in order to get a more formal assessment? Not really in terms of career uh, assessments. We have taken it a little step by step at the at the onset where we're trying to find out whether or not the person can, for example, function in terms of reading, literacy, that kind of thing. But so far we haven't really dealt too much into the area of referring out for career testing. Mm -hmm. But that's certainly an area that's important. And if you're going to make anyone's uh, a life impact in terms of the education and employment, that's a very important uh, criterion to mm -hmm. consider. Ohio Northern, I, I will say that it sort of in my research and putting together the Special Needs Offenders Bulletin, I spoke with several officers out in the field. Uh, I don't remember specifically who they were right now, but who have had this experience referring uh, offenders for career testing, specific types of ass outside assessments by professionals to find out where they are toward the beginning of the supervision so that an appropriate supervision plan could be developed. And so perhaps if you want to contact me after the broadcast via telephone or email, um, I, I can help you out with that and perhaps hook you up with one of these officers that, uh, that I talk to. Also, you'll notice in the Special Needs Offenders Bulletin that there's at least something there that talks about um, making referrals for literacy testing. Um, in fact, in the vignette, you noticed the, the officer going over the conditions of supervision, um, but not really being too sure about whether this person understood them. So, uh, excellent question. Let's get quickly to Jennifer Marsh's question about assessment tools. Are there, are there assessment tools that you can use uh, in-house other than sort of your, uh, Brian, your uh, uh, reasoning and rehabilitation cognitive assessment tool, which is a good one? Anything else you can use? I am somewhat familiar with the SASE-1 okay. testing. I know that there are some districts that have used that particular tool mm -hmm. and What's have that found that um, to evaluate the um, vocational needs of a oh, defender, um, whether or not they have a substance abuse issue. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not too sure, but might even evaluate their level, their reading ability level. But there may be some individuals out there in the district that may have used that tool and would like to call in and share that information with the district. Excellent, excellent. Um, hope that a answers your question, uh, Jennifer, and Ohio Northern. Again, any other further follow-ups or questions, you can certainly direct them to me after the broadcast, and we'll try to get to them. Um, Elizabeth, let's talk about sort of the, um, the officer's attitude during this, during this uh, intake interview. What, what's, your, what's, your, what, what's your gut on it? Well, she clearly seemed to have done her homework. Mm -hmm. She had reviewed the file material. She seemed to have a good understanding of what the release conditions were. She didn't get rattled by his right. defensiveness. But at the same time, I think when she brought up the issue about his environment, her timing might have been a little off because she set off the defensiveness mode. And so I think she might have tried to make a few more positive connections, maybe back off a little bit, uh, find some common ground, and build on some of those positive uh, connections that she, she could make. I think the defensiveness and the resistance is going to be there anyway, but um, we, we need to start to build that trust up front. Mm -hmm. So overall, I think she did a good job. Um, I just think she might have backed off a little bit in terms of that environment question because mm -hmm. that's clearly a sore point for him. Mm -hmm. Brian, what do you think about the te techniques that she used um, and whether there's anything more that either she could have done in the actual intake interview or whether there, what more she could do in the future? I thought she handled the situation <clears throat> very well and I agree with, agree with Elizabeth. She maintained control when it appeared that Nathan was getting angry or getting upset, mm -hmm. she controlled the situation by the body gesture. Mm -hmm. um, she didn't feed into his anger, which I thought was very important. Mm -hmm. This is the initial interview. There's going to be many more interviews to come. Mm -hmm. Let's get to the next level. Get the information, read the condition, 
reassure, uh, assure that he understands the conditions, give him an assignment, have him come back as soon as possible and deal with issues, more issues the next time he comes back. Um, I would not encourage confrontation, the initial interview. Right, so mm -hmm. we're talking about achieving common ground here. Exactly. We're talking about not jumping to conclusions exactly. about where this person is at. We're trying to, we're talking about trying to suppress any annoyance or anger that that person may be trying to provoke right. in you, which is probably something that they're used to doing and getting. Uh, very interesting. Um, without further ado, let's go out to our, our, our folks in New York Western, our Push to Talk site out there. New York Western, are you with us? Hi, Mark. It's Colleen Ray Hopeuler. Hi, Colleen. How are you doing? I'm good, thanks. Uh, we thought the officer handled herself pretty well. We mm -hmm. would absolutely concur with what Brian and Elizabeth have already said about not letting um, his negative attitude escalate. One of the things that we noticed was that Nathan was ready to terminate that interview before it even began, <laughs> That's right. and the officer didn't let that happen. Uh, we also were impressed with she was very clear and specific with him mm -hmm. what she wanted him to do when she wanted it done when mm -hmm. she wanted things back and that um, eliminates any confusion or eliminates the defendant being able to say you know you didn't give me enough information I you weren't real clear about that so we thought those were a couple things that she did very well she also reinforced some of the pauses that he had in his background regarding his education, his employment. Again, even though they were minimal, like Elizabeth has touched on, she reinforced it. Um, so those are some of the things that we thought she did very well. Uh, I'll tell, uh, does this, did this scenario ring true uh, to you at all? I mean, is this something that you are familiar with and something you've come up against before? I'm sorry, Mark. Could you just repeat the question? We had turned our volume down. Could you repeat the question? Sure. Um, I'm wondering whether this vignette that, or this intake interview was something that rings true to you, something that you've seen before. Yeah, we thought the negativeness and the resistance rang very true. Um, while we agree with Brian that we wouldn't want to escalate the situation, right. I do think I would have wanted to have um, done a little bit of attitude adjustment a little earlier on there, though. <laughs> that's, that's putting it lightly, I think. Um, um, excellent. Mark, can I... Can I touch base, too? We wanted to give some information about the federal bonding program. Um, that program now is administered by states. It used to be administered by the federal government through an insurance agency. It's no longer done that way. It's done by states. And at least in New York State, anyways, it's done by the Department of Labor. And for instance, in the whole state of New York, there are only 50 bonds to be given out. So wow. it's not a program that um, is a, as accessible as we would like it to be. Excellent point uh, and something for officers to be aware of. Um, I, I, and thank you so much for, for, for that and for the, for the interchange as well. Um, we're, we're, we're running low on time for this segment, so Brian, briefly, I wanted to go to the last question uh, uh, for this segment and then get out to, uh, to the Push to Talk sites. Um, okay, this was a pretrial setting. You are a probation officer. Uh, would you do anything differently in, in a probation setting as opposed to a pretrial setting? And I'm particularly interested in, 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 in terms of the, the length of time of supervision uh, and the amount of leverage that probation officers have versus the amount of leverage that a pretrial officer might have. I have to agree with the officer in the New York District. I would have mildly confronted um, Nathan's attitude, mm -hmm. um, talked about Nathan's attitude, um, encouraged him to work on that attitude so that we can have a working relationship, um, engage him more in dialogue. So you would have explicitly oh, addressed yes, I would have talked to him about it. Um, I would encourage him that we, we want to have a good experience here. I'm not his enemy. Mm -hmm. I'm here to help you and the better attitude you have, the harder that I will work for you. And it's very important that we have a give and take relationship. Mm -hmm. And I would communicate that during the initial interview. Mm -hmm. I do not want Nathan to leave my office with a negative attitude, fearful what he may do thereafter. So I want to address that in my office. Um, calm it down as much as I can sure. in my office. Not spend a lot of time with it. This is my initial interview. I have right. a lot of more time to spend with Nathan. Right. And I will address those issues each each um, office visit. Right, so you're going to take a long-term view of this yes. thing. Yes. Elizabeth, turning to you, because you've done both the pretrial mm -hmm. uh, and probation sides, um, does the special condition of employment add any leverage for, for the pretrial officer? 
I think it does. Uh, I think all the conditions are important because they, they have a, they're consequence-based and they're consequence-oriented. So clearly, if they're not going to comply, the court's going to know about it. But I think in terms of the employment issue, if the, if the officer has done a, a substantial bail investigation in those time crunches that they have to work in, they're going to know that he's going to, he or she is going to need a, a job or education, and so that condition is important to have. However, on the other hand, I think it's important for us to note that in some areas, for example, in the District of Arizona, where we have a large a rural area, we have Native American nations out there, mm -hmm. where jobs are scarce and they're hard to come by. It's important and sometimes, for them to do. Exactly. Sometimes, if that condition is there, we may set the client up for failure right. because we're trying to impose something that's going to be difficult in an economically depressed area. Right. So perhaps in that, in that time, we need to take a look at whether or not education needs to be the focus instead of employment. Right. But one or the other is important. Just get them doing something. Get them doing something. All right. We, we've only got a, a, about 30 seconds left here, but I did want to go okay. quickly out to Texas Southern Probation. Texas Southern, are you with us? We sure are. Hi. Hi, Mark. Uh, this is Hilda Brian Benavides. <laughs> Welcome aboard. Uh, any reactions or questions to what we've been talking about so far? We pretty much agreed with the panel. Uh, we just feel that, uh, unlike pretrial, the probation officer does have the benefit of the longevity in the interviewing process, mm -hmm. uh, the assessment of the offender's cognitive, educational, financial, and basic skills. Mm -hmm. We also felt we had a different uh, impression of the pretrial officer. Mm -hmm. We appreciated her thoroughness, yet we felt we would display a positive attitude and show maybe more interest for the offender's needs. Um, I, I use interviewing techniques that would provide clues to the offender's characteristics and basic skills. Excellent point. I think that you are definitely reinforcing what Elizabeth was talking about before in terms of trying to suppress that annoyance, perhaps deal with his confront, deal with his, confront his resistance, and sort of deal with his uh, deal with that up front and try to put a positive spin on this thing. Uh, great points. Uh, I'm sorry we've got we've got to cut it off now and, and get get on to the next segment. Um, but before we do that, we want to take a short break. Uh, and as we go to it, we're going to leave you with the learning principles from this last discussion. Thanks for your participation. It's really adding a lot of energy to this, to this broadcast, at least here in the studio. We want to keep Mark Maggio busy uh, with your faxes and phone calls. We'll make him earn his money, uh, and we'll be back in five. I'm an evaluation form. Surely seen me before. Well, I'm part of your materials and I perform a vital chore. Well, the information in me helps the center to take stock. It helps them make their programs work to help you do your job. Please fill me in. Please fill me in. We, we need, need this information. Please fill me in. Please fill me in. Oh, we need to know the score. Please fill me in. Please fill me in. Your feedback is important. And if you don't complete this form, we'll sing this song again. Your feedback is important. Please fill in the evaluation form available in your program materials or online on the JNET. Hi, I'm Michael Burney, your host for Court to Court. Our mission is to provide education and information that will enhance your job and how the courts function. What ongoing challenges do you face each day? What innovative practices are other districts applying? What makes your work satisfying? We'll find these stories and share them with you. We're excited about what's in store. Be sure to watch Court to Court on the FJTN. Check the FJTN Bulletin or the JNET for broadcast dates and times. Substance abuse issues play a major part in supervising defendants and offenders. Now, probation and pretrial services officers can get the latest information directly from national experts. This is among the most complex phenomena facing our society today. Live on the FJTN, the Federal Judicial Center presents Substance Abuse, a continuing education series which brings you the latest on research, policy, and strategy. Check the FJTM Bulletin or the JNET for air dates of the next edition of this provocative series. <laughs>